This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only. It is not medical care or advice. Clinicians should rely on their own medical judgments when advising their patients. Patients in need of medical care should consult their personal care provider. Welcome to That's Pediatrics, where we sit down with physicians, scientists, and experts to discuss the latest discoveries and innovations in pediatric health care. From UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, welcome to That's Pediatrics. I'm Arvind Srinath, Associate Professor of Pediatrics, your co-host, along with... And I'm Allie Williams, a pediatric hospitalist here at UPMC Hospital. Today we have the opportunity to talk with Dr. Jennifer Marin. Dr. Marin is a professor of pediatrics in the divisions of emergency medicine and radiology at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and uh, as well as UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. She serves as the medical director for point of care ultrasound at our hospital and direct and uh, completed her pediatric residency at Anne and Robert Lurie Children's Hospital followed by a Pediatric Emergency Medicine Fellowship at uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, where she also earned her Master's of Science in Clinical Epidemiology. She spent an additional year learning point-of-care ultrasound in the Department of Emergency Medicine at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. She is one of the pioneers in pediatric point-of-care ultrasound and has published extensively in the field and lectures and teaches internationally. Welcome, Dr. Marin. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Thank you, you for having me. feel your face me? reddening with all of that? Know, you such should. Such a kind <laughs> introduction. Thank you guys so much. It's such an honor to be here. I'm a big fan of the show. It's an honor to have you. So, Dr. Marin, th- th- thanks again for joining us. Can you tell us about the path that you took to get interested in this really what I think we think is novel area? Yeah, so when I was a fellow, we did not have point of care ultrasound in our emergency department. It was not something that we did in pediatrics. And my very first rotation as a fellow was at the adult trauma center. So I hadn't even stepped foot in the children's hospital. And I was on my trauma rotation and our job as the pediatric fellows were to just do the primary secondary survey. So I practiced this at home Mm -hmm. and like thought I was getting really good at it. And so one day I'm doing my primary secondary survey and one of the trauma attendings yells at me to quote, do the fast. And I didn't really understand what he was talking about. I thought he was asking me to just, to be more efficient, to go a little (laughs) bit faster in my survey. And so I went a little bit faster and he continued to say, Jennifer, do the fast, do the fast. And suffice it to say, one of the trauma fellows like sort of came in and rescued me and did this fast exam, which of course we all know now is the focused assessment with sonography and trauma. And this is an exam that we do with bedside ultrasound for trauma patients looking for free fluid. And I went home that night and decided that I was no longer going to feel that shame and humiliation, which I don't know about for you guys is a very potent motivator. Yeah. And I learned about the FAST exam and really from there it grew and became an interest of mine to use this technology. So I came back to the children's hospital and realized no one was doing this. We didn't have a machine. And, and what could I do to get things moving and how could I learn it? And that really is how I became interested in it. So can you tell us a little bit more about um, what we use it for in pediatrics as well? Because I, as a clinician, um, have a hard time understanding what this is used for versus just like ordering a regular ultrasound. Yeah. So, you know, the answer is it depends on where you work. I think that's the first thing and what resources you have available. Um, We here at Children's Hospital have 24-hour around-the-clock radiology ultrasound and our ultrasound techs and our ultrasound faculty are amazing so we don't have the need for doing pyloric ultrasounds for example which is something that maybe some of our community partners would learn to do at the bedside Um, similarly appendicitis um, gallbladder pathology things like that but in our emergency department and i can speak to other divisions that are using the technology as well in our emergency department you know we find that it is really useful for evaluating soft tissue infections whether there's an abscess or a cellulitis we do it pretty routinely for patients who are limping or have hip pain to know mm. if there's an effusion as the cause of their pain yeah. we do it a lot for procedural guidance uh, ultrasound guided peripheral ivs we place all the time 
uh, with ultrasound guidance, obviously. We use it for cardiac function. We use it for pericardial effusion, for trauma patients, for pleural effusion. So uh, we do it for patients who are uh, hypotensive or who have unexplained tachycardia, and we want to know the reasons for why they're in shock. And I think, you know, if we were to sum it up, it would be for a patient where you really need the information pretty quickly. Uh, you can incorporate it into your clinical examination. And it's also a really nice tool because we can repeat it. So if we do an intervention, like say we have a child who does have undifferentiated tachycardia and they get fluids and they get better or don't get better, we can repeat our exam. We can look again at the IVC in the heart and we can see, okay, what's changed now? And we oh, can compare it. Interesting. And that's just what we're doing in the emergency department. You know, I can tell you that our global hospital-wide program has 15 divisions in it, which is really amazing if you think about it. You'd be really surprised to learn all the different divisions that are using point of care ultrasound. So just to name a few, you know, our anesthesiologists, both of our ICUs, uh, excuse me, all three of our ICUs, the PIC UCI and NICU, our general surgeons, our nephrologists, ophthalmology uses it wow. all what? the time. <laughs> I know. There's more. Rheumatology, nephrology, yeah. urology. They are probably our biggest users, believe it or not. Uh, adolescent gynecology, and neurology. Wow. Yeah. All of these are using just the, the bedside kind of point of care correct. that you've developed. My goodness. That's correct. And PM&R. I forgot PM&R. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. Without, so, uh, and I swear I'm not being a salesman for this, but at the same time, it <laughs> sounds like it might be, but I'm doing it for everybody's, everybody's benefit. But, but without this type of mechanism, mm-hmm. what do you think care would be like? It's interesting because for so many decades, we weren't using it, right? Right. And as with many things, pediatrics is sort of the last to get on board, right? Mm -hmm. And there's good reasons for that. But emergency medicine has been using this for decades and decades, since the 80s, pretty consistently. So, you know, arguably, our care would be perhaps not as efficient. Mm -hmm. Um, There are studies that really have shown that length of stay improves when this is used, that accuracy of diagnoses is improved, that patient Mm -hmm. satisfaction is improved. I will tell you that in addition to the evidence, anecdotally, our patients really appreciate it when we can do the exam at the bedside and show them the images, explain it to them, and make a diagnosis quicker and potentially more, you know, accurately. So now, so that's really that's really interesting because what what I think about is the technique and, you know, what expertise one needs to do this. And I'm looking at your credentials again, and you are under two divisions here, and one of them is radiology. So what type of training was involved for you to become an expert in this, and what does that entail for your colleagues to be able to do this too? Yeah, so the training that I did was coming from a place where I wasn't getting any training as part of my residency, as part of my fellowship. And I'll also say as part of my medical school education. Mm -hmm. And we can talk about that because that's a really big area of growth. Um, But the training that that I did was in that context of not – of being completely – a complete novice. Mm -hmm. And I also was training to be a director, to start a program. And so that training is above and beyond just learning how to do it and how to interpret the studies. And I think that, you know, we have gotten really good here and at many other children's hospitals at creating a program that effectively trains our fellows over the course of their three years to be very comfortable and very competent in their ability to go out and perform these exams unsupervised and just like they do with any other skill that we teach them, you know, in terms of intubation and um, all kinds of procedures. 
That's amazing you've integrated that into your fellowship here, which is just, it's quite fantastic. I know, so, I was thinking that too, just because yeah. your, your fellows are so lucky, your emergency medicine fellows are lucky to have that. And you mentioned all of these other divisions that have this as well. What type of training are they getting through your work as the medical director of this program? So interestingly, this is such a, a timely question, Allie, because we are currently working on a series of about 35 educational modules that are going to be posted online that all the divisions are putting together each are relevant to their to the applications that they perform and our hope is that this will standardize the training process Um, not just within a division when you have people who are learning to use that application but also across divisions when you've got for example you know Vascular access is probably the most common one. There's like six different divisions that place ultrasound guided either central Mm -hmm. lines or peripheral lines. So we want to make sure that everyone is learning it in the same manner and doing the same kind of exam. Um, So, you know, it's interesting, I think, that a lot of the surgical subspecialties have been incorporating ultrasound into their residency training for a really long time. And so a lot of the faculty that start, they it's just part of what they do. Nice. You know, it's not a novel nice. tool. Yeah. So it's nice. a very different, um, it's just a very different way to think about it. Is, this is probably a very silly question. Is it the same ultrasound machine as like if I were to order one and an ultrasonographer were to do it? Or is it like a different actual like technological machine that you have to use for it. Thank you, Allie. <laughs> I mean, I'm just thinking like at you know community yeah. hospitals, they might not, like you said, they don't have 24-7 ultrasonographers. We're very lucky here. Um, and I'm just wondering what kind of not only expertise you need, but equipment you need to achieve this. Yeah, so the answer, the short answer is it, it really doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, the machines are comparable in that they have the same basic functions, mm-hmm. and we could certainly do our exams on their machines, and they could almost certainly do their exams on our machines. Okay. That said, point-of-care ultrasound machines typically are more portable mm-hmm. and smaller, lighter, a little less expensive. It makes sense. (laughs) (laughs) And have, you know, not the variety of transducers or probes that maybe the radiology suite would have. Gotcha. Because we're doing very specific applications on very specific patients. So, you know, we have three to four transducers on our machines. um, And, um, you know, the radiologists may have more than that. Our, you know, ophthalmology colleagues have one transducer because that's really all they do. They're looking at eyeballs. I mean, right. very small area. <laughs> very small area. Yeah, you'd be surprised how much information they can get from that little eyeball. That's amazing. It's impressive. Which makes you wonder, like, and I'm, I, I'm sorry, I'm thinking medical shows here because of what you do. Like, I can imagine part of your training was, like, on the field, right? The quote-unquote right. field, right? But, <laughs> but can you use this technology on the field and for the audience members what I'm getting at which is probably wrong but I'm just going to say it is like you know you are in an emergency and it's not in the hospital but you're elsewhere and you're trying to figure out how best to approach a patient and help someone is that is that can this technology be used that way yeah it's such a good question Arvin because one of the areas within the community of point of care ultrasound is field use and yeah. using this in underdeveloped countries using this in times of war, using this in areas where there is not an x-ray machine or a CAT scanner for miles. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in the Department of Emergency Medicine, I'm told that their pre-hospital folks are actually using it now more. And so they will carry this with them and they'll go to codes and have the, this very tiny, you know, very portable ultrasound machine available to use that in a patient's home. Wow. wow. Which is really interesting. Wow. That's wild. Um, I was also thinking too, you know, you have said a couple times, well, that depends because this is new technology and this is very much so evolving quickly. Um, and you're doing a great job here training. Is there like a, a national push to have this done as well? Or how do you centralize this um, across state lines, across county lines? What are what are we doing to utilize this in all kinds of places? Yeah, well, you know, I will say that the 
ACE, that the American Board of Pediatrics has started to include point of care ultrasound training in certain specialties. Wow. That's awesome. So for mm-hmm. pediatric emergency medicine, we have it on our subboards. Oh, um, wow. There's a few other there's a few other specialties that have it listed. At what point will it be part of the pediatrics residency requirements for board training? I imagine it will happen. Yeah. I, I think it's only a matter of time. It's absolutely part of the training for emergency medicine residents, um, the surgical residents. You know, I, I think that it's becoming standard of care, and it's only a matter of time. Yeah, I can remember a time when I trained where when we placed central lines, y- you placed them blind. Right. Right. You know, it's a terrible yeah. term to use, but you, you, you use landmarks, right? You're palpating, yes. <laughs> you're pal- right. You're not, you know, there's no blindfold, but you're, you're using landmarks. Yeah. And now that would actually con- be considered inappropriate to mm-hmm. do. That would be considered substandard care. And now that's all we do. We use bedside ultrasound to place those central lines. And I think that with a lot of the applications that we are using it for, it's going to ultimately become standard of care. And so if you're not using it for certain conditions, if you're not using it for certain procedures, then you're going to be providing suboptimal care. So I'm going to bring up something. Speaking of suboptimal care, it's going to be controversial. You know, When I was training back in the day is that you know there was always this talk of, utilizing your physical exam, mm-hmm. utilizing your, your clinical gestalt mm-hmm. for what we're doing and how we have the luxury of being in a quaternary care hospital, have the technology to be able to do things, and how much is being taken away from the physical examination and utilizing what we're doing. So what I'm getting at in my really roundabout, loquacious way is what resistance have you met to this technology and dissemination? And is there, not, is there have you had to advocate and or re-educate or bring up utility against that some of that mentality that I'm getting at? Yes. <laughs> Next question. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so absolutely. Yeah. I, I think, you know, what I, what I can say is fortunately here at mm-hmm. UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, things have been very, things have been great. Everyone has been very supportive. Um, that is not the case for many of my colleagues around the country. And there is resistance. And I think that a lot of the resistance does come from just a lack of understanding of what it is. At the end of the day, everyone's goals are the same to provide the best patient care, right? right? And to right. do what's best for the do what's best for the patient. I will say that I have found that in certain cases, just educating people about what it is that we're doing and what it is that we're not doing does tend to overcome some of that resistance. But there there does still remain some, and it's part of the reason why not every single hospital has a program like ours. Or it's why every single pediatric emergency medicine fellowship, you know, doesn't have a program like this. The majority of it has to do with the support that you get from the people who are in charge. Got it. Well, I imagine, too, it's also important because you mentioned that not everywhere has the same resources, right? So um, while you have the opportunity to train to utilize this, depending on where you get a job, um, you may or may not use this in your career. I mean, we hope, I, I would assume you hope as the medical director of this program mm-hmm. that eventually everywhere gets these tiny little machines that we can do all of this great work with. But for now, sure. it's not like that right now. Right. No, that's absolutely right. So we've talked about the past and the present of this program. Where do you see the future of this program going? What's your next steps? Yeah, that's an interesting question, Allie. Mm -hmm. So I would say uh, the next goals for our program would be to have the pediatric hospital medicine team on our on board. I was thinking it. As well as the pediatric gastroenterology love team. I love it. On board. Firm yes. Yeah. I'm gonna have to talk to those fellowship directors about yeah. this. And yeah. I'm sure they would yeah. be on board and have division lots of chiefs. fellows that would love yeah. to learn this. Yes, yes. And your division chiefs. Tell your friends. Yeah. yeah, I mean I think that the technology is is coming down the pike. You know, these medical students are graduating with a ton of experience and a ton of knowledge in point of care ultrasound. And the expectation on their part is that they're going to train and practice in an environment where that is used, where it's standard of care. So I think that it behooves us on many levels to use it where it's applicable. 
yeah. you know, to use it where it can help us, where we can benefit patients. For all of our listeners out there that have, you know, enjoyed this as much as I have listening to this, is there anywhere um, online that they can look at your program or find more information about it or contact information to get in touch with you? We always like to talk about any sort of social media handles or websites that they can look at so that they can get more information. Yes, Allie. In fact, there is. We, we have a website. Our program has a website. Anyone who's interested in more information on the program can go to chp.edu backslash our O-U-R hyphen services backslash POCUS, P-O-C-U-S. And on that website, just tells you a little bit about what we do, all the different divisions. You can see all of the different POCUS leads. Those are the leaders in each of the divisions who are in charge of point of care ultrasound and serve on the team. Thank you again so much for coming today. We were so excited to learn about this and we'll have to have you back to learn more about the growth of this program. That will be great. You guys can report back to me on your divisional progress. That sounds Focus. excellent. Absolutely. Sounds great. And great thank you all man. for listening to That's Pediatrics. Thank you, guys. You can find other episodes of That's Pediatrics on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. For more information about this podcast or our guests, please visit chp.edu slash that's pediatrics. If you've enjoyed this episode, please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to keep up with our new content. You can also email us at podcast.upmc at gmail.com with any feedback or ideas for topics you'd like our experts to cover on future episodes. Thank you again for listening to That's Pediatrics. Tune in next time. <laughs>